Welcome to Chapter 8, Peers and Delinquency. We're going to be covering juvenile gangs and groups. I want to begin by just saying that probably one of the hardest things I've ever done as an educator is lecture about gangs and groups while teaching a juvenile justice class at the prison in Connell. Um, it's hard to be able to discuss these things with um, those that are so deeply enmeshed in this type of lifestyle or have been at some point in their lifetime. So I just, I want you to keep that in mind as we move through this chapter is that sometimes we lose sight of the reality of gangs and groups and we just follow what media uh, tells us about it. And we lose sight of the reality of living a lifestyle in these types of groups. So, Children between ages of 8 and 14 are often seeking out stable peer groups for many reasons, but um, both the number and variety of friendships increase as children go through their adolescence. So there's going to be peers that they come in contact with in their life course, cliques, crowds, and um, when we talk about peers and delinquency, we're talking about these peer group relationships that can be closely tied to delinquent behavior. So there's a term of co-offending, which is delinquent acts that are committed in small groups. Um, and there are some theories that look at the direction of peer influence, um, social control theory, labeling theory, social learning theory, routine activities theory, and rational choice theory, which we have definitely learned about um, throughout this chapter. So you can see on this slide, when we talk about the different theories and how they look at it, um, this slide breaks that down and um, looks at the different um, uh, sociological theories and really how they relate to peer delinquency. So youth gravitate towards cliques and those cliques um, provide them with some support, assurance, protection, um, direction, and peers provide social and emotional basis for antisocial activity. So what are gangs? Experts are often at odds with the precise definition. A variety of definitions exist. Um, the expert Malcolm Klein argues two factors. Um, a, members have self-recognition of their gang status and use special vocabulary, clothing, signs, colors, graffiti, and names to set themselves apart. There is a commitment to criminal activity, although most spend time doing non-criminal activities. Um, if we're looking at the National Gang Center's definition, there's some certain things that uh, they take into consideration some divine, defining factors. Three or more members uh, share some sort of identity which is linked to the name and symbols. They view themselves as a gang recognized by others. There's some permanence and a degree of organization, leadership that evolves, and they're involved in an elevated level of criminal activity. So how do gangs develop? And gangs develop, um, have been developing for long years. It's not a recent phenomenon. And there are, you know, gangs in the 50s and 60s had a threat of violence that swept public consciousness. And then in the mid 60s, gangs kind of seemed to disappear. And there was a decline due to successful community based programs. But then the gangs reemerged in the early 1970s in New York, South Bronx, LA with the Crips and the Bloods. So as gangs reemerged, uh, the involvement in the sale of illegal drugs lured many for those profits. And a natural consequence of the economic and social di dislocation, um, which was a shift from relative high paying manufacturing to low wage service economy. So successful adult role models and stable families declined. So there was this lure of gang and easy profits irresistible to these kids that really had nowhere else to turn. So in contemporary gangs, um, at all levels, the social strata is from rural to metropolitan. 
There are more than 30,000 gangs with almost 850,000 members. Um, as far as location, uh, it's usually often an urban phenomenon, although there is significant numbers of gang, gang involvement in smaller towns and suburban areas. But large urban areas, transitional neighborhoods is where we see a lot of them. Um, and with migration, many jurisdictions have experienced gang migration. More than half of all gang members have come in from other areas. So with the formation of gangs, um, there is a sense of territory territoriality, so certain area. Um, many of the gang members are going to live in close proximity to one another, and that's like a sense of belonging that exists within the gangs. Uh, delinquent gangs tend to be small and transitory, and often members belong to more than a single group or clique, and they develop extensive networks of delinquent associates. So with their communication, they are seeking some sort of recognition from the rivals. Um, wall writings are elaborate among Latino gangs. They have a secret vocabulary. And of course, flashing and uh, tossing gang signs can escalate into confrontations between uh, gangs um, back and forth. So how about gangs in cyberspace? There's a use of cell phones, obviously, and the internet to, uh, to communicate with each other. So some of the gangs and the gangs, most of the gangs, I should say, um, are devoted to violence and to protecting the turf, right? The neighborhood. There's drug trafficking and others that are involved in recreational activities rather than just crime. But modern gangs have several characteristics. Make sure. Um, modern gangs have several characteristics. So there's a race of racial and ethnic groups, a mixture of it. I said a race, I meant a mixture of it. Mixture of symbols, graffiti, uh, colors associated with the gang, uh, less concern over turf or territory. Uh, members switch from one gang to another. So that's gonna be some of the modern gang characteristics. But when we talk about cohesiveness, um, experts refer to gangs as near groups. There's limited cohesion and impermanence. So minimal consensus of norms, oftentimes there's shifting membership, disturbed leadership, limited definitions of membership expectations. And some gangs have pockets or members who are structured and organized. It really just depends. So you can see um, some, uh, some visuals on the slide that talk about different signs for these different gangs. So the age of members are usually from 88, excuse me, to 55 years old. Uh, gender is going to be traditionally male dominated, although mixed gangs are becoming more and more common. Um, females are often involved in one of three ways, uh, usually as aux auxiliaries or branches of male gangs, or they're part of a sexually mixed games, or as an autonomous gang group, you know, of female gang members. So why do girls gang? join gangs. Um, and there can be a variety of reasons, but really we know that, you know, the financial opportunities, having that identity and status, uh, peer pressure can play a role, maybe family dysfunction, but protection exists in the gangs. So it can often provide girls with a sense of sisterhood, just like the brotherhood that is desired by many um, males that are in gangs. So if we're talking about ethnic and racial comparisons, African-American and or Latino youth are predominant. One half are Latino, one third African-American, and about 10% are European-American. And the rest is other races, um, for example, Asian. And the ethnic distribution of gangs correspond really to the geographic locations. 
So if we're talking about some African American gangs, um, breaking this down, here's um, some familiar ones might be the uh, Black Peace Stone Nation, the Bloods, the Crips. Um, and you can see that, you know, they were first organized in early 1920s. Um, unique characteristics, nondescript attire, tattooing, distinctive graffiti. And with Latino gangs, uh, MS-13 is one of the ones uh, we hear a lot about. Um, there are rituals to prove machismo, um, different uh, a hierarchy in those gangs, many colorful territory markings, graffiti, uh, definite strong sense of turf and area. And the most feared Latino gang is the MS-13. It really is the nation's most dangerous gang. So Asian gangs are prominent in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and Houston. Um, some that we know of is the Waching, Joe Boys, the Yuli, the Tiny Rascals. Um, and we can see they're more organized than other gangs. They definitely have leaders, less territorial, and very much less openly visual. As far as Anglo gangs, the punkers, stoners, skinheads, um, these first youth gangs were European Americans during the 1950s, and they were competing with African American and Latino gangs. Uh, today, they really account for 10% of all gang members, so very, very low numbers. Um, of the Anglo gangs. So hybrid gangs, mix of racial and ethnic groups, mixture of symbols and graffiti, wearing colors associated with rivals. So they're, they're really just a mix of um, all of these other components that we have talked about. So when we're talking about criminality and violence, we know that members of youth gangs are going to commit more crimes than other groups of youths. And the reason being is because of these um, hypothesis, selection, facilitation, enhancement hypothesis, which you guys can read a little more about within the group. But there are patterns that we're looking for in gang criminality. So drug dealing or other types of criminal activity. Um, gang members tend to be more violent, um, and there are many uh, reasons that the violence is, is used, but um, there is prestigiousness that is assumed by the members of the gang when they commit certain crimes. So why do you join gangs? We're going to look at a couple of different views here. Um, if we're talking about anthropology, the anthro anthropolo anthropological view, excuse me, talks about the appeal to tribal instincts. Um, and then with the social disorganization, social cultural view, this is where youth gangs are, are being said to be formed due to destructive sociocultural for forces in disorganized areas. This is really where I believe a lot of it exists, is them looking for connection, looking for um, ability to have someone else that cares about them when maybe their sociological factors, family, um, social drivers aren't there as much as they need to be. Anonymy, um, you know, this is the alienation that leads to gang involvement. And this is where we talk about social conditions are encouraging gang activity drug dealing, protection in the, um, you know, uh, HUD neighborhoods, it, it all exists and is all a, a viable reason for these youths to join gangs. Uh, with trait view, we're looking at um, biological and psychological traits that might be make people prone to violence and to joining the gangs. With life course view, gang involvement is indirectly related to continued participation in street crime into the probability of being arrested. And rational choice view is where youths may make a rational choice to join a gang. 
So how do we control gang activity? You know, there is lots of um, good and bad to these types of activities to control gangs. Um, different youth service programs, gang details, gang units. But unfortunately, what sometimes exists in our society is that people are very scared to work with gang members um, because of what they do. And so it can be um, a difficult system to try to figure out. Um, uh, law enforcement agencies have gang units and they tend to do a lot of the enforcement work, uh, but as far as the prevention, I'm not sure that it exists there. But that's where the community control efforts come in, um, gang outreaches, recreation, uh, churches that come into play. So there's a lot of good things that go on there in the communities to help detour youth from getting involved in the gangs. That'll do it for this chapter. Have a good night.